So here's a couple more pieces that we can think about for the future. The Mathis der Mahler Symphony by Hindemith and the variations on a theme of Hindemith by William Walton, who was a great pal of Hindemith's um, from early on. Hindemith played the very first performance of the Walton Viola Concerto, played the, the solo viola part, so they've been chums for a long, long time uh, before that was written. Um, now, the Mathis der Mahler Symphony, this was from 1934, funnily enough, five years after that first performance of the Walton Viola Concerto, um, it, it's a three movement piece. It's it's a little it's a little bit like off cuts. Well, a bit more than off cuts from the, an opera that that Hindemith was writing um, called Mattis der Mahler. Um, it plays like a symphony rather than a suite from from the, from the opera. But the first movement, for example, is exactly the same as the the overture of the opera, and some of the other movements. The second movement is verbatim from the opera, although it doesn't the the theme of the opera the argument about artistic freedom uh, for the artist um, and how how important it is um, doesn't really come up so much in the in the um, symphony but it is kind of relevant especially since it was written in the 30s in Germany so it does have a, a big depth to it um, in the opera Matthias Grunwald is the is the uh, title character is a real real painter from the pre-reformation time um, he's famous now for writing for painting his altarpiece in um, Isenheim in um, near France in France in a monastery. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing thing. It's not really in, in one piece anymore, so they can display it separately. But it had, it had all these flaps to it, so on a particular day you could open up. So on this way you'd have paintings on this side. It would open up and you'd have paintings on the other side. And you could open it up in all sorts of different ways for different times of the year. It's a great, great thing to, to look at. The painting's incredibly vivid, very dramatic for the time. Um, and the, the three movements of the, of the symphony are based on three of these paintings. The first one is called Engel Concert, Angel's Concert. And it's a picture of the, the birth of Jesus. So there's a picture of, of Mary and Jesus in the manger and there's angels on the side playing lots of instruments, violins, cellos and things like that. Uh, maybe playing Happy Birthday to You or something like that. But it's a beautiful, beautiful mu movement. Starts as a slow introduction um, and it's it's got this, it's a G major start. Starts with the horns and then has this lovely chord, just like the Talis Fantasia chord, the first first chord of Talis Fantasia, which is the light on the, on the child. Um, and in this slow introduction, the, the main tune is this, Hindemith uses a folk song called uh, The Three Angels Sang, and it's done on the trombones. So when the trombones play, it's just accompanied by, by the strings. Um, now, I'm sure a lot of you have played Hindemith before, you know the kind of language. Um, wind players, we've all done it. He's, he's written a, a sonata for every instrument. A really good man for, for adding to the repertoire. Um, fourths, the interval of the fourth is very hindemith Um And so you'll, you'll recognise the language straight away. Um, so once the, the trombones play it, it happens in three times, wind, wind, uh, woodwind and horns do it second time, gradually the orchestration gets bigger, and then there's this almighty climax when the trumpets come in. Absolutely fantastic music. dramatic um there's a when it gets fast it's a very very gentle very typically hindemith tune uh, lots of fourths again 
and uh, it just plays out like a very gentle, not too dramatic sonata form movement. Um, the, in the recapitulation, all the three tunes come back at the same time, and so the, the brass, the trombones and horns are in three, and everyone else is in two. So car crash possibilities, but really, really good. It's about fifteen minutes, uh, 10, 10 minutes long or so. Really good. Uh, the second movement is called Entombment, and it's a picture at the bottom of the altarpiece of, of Jesus being taken to his tomb. A dead Jesus, a very dead Jesus. Again, a very, very emotionally charged painting. Um, and this is one where we can really see the, the language, this lovely fourths language, the use of the fourths in Hindemith, how, it, how emotionally beautiful it can be. Um, it starts off with the strings, there's no no triads at all, it's mostly, well it's all thirds, it starts off with the strings and then there's a kind of an answer in the winds. Beautiful music. Um, the, the slow movement particularly is so lovely. The the end of the um, end of the movement is the end of the opera, and it just kind of dies away. And oh, it's fabulous, fabulous piece. Um, and the last movement, the Temptation of Saint Anthony, and the painting. I would thoroughly recommend having a look at it. I'm sure you can find it online. Um, it looks like something out of Blake or some kind of fantasy fantasy novel, but. Painted in 15, 1509 or something like that, I think. Um, really scary, really scary. And so poor old St Anthony is just trying to get away from all these temptations. Um, and so the the movement has this real hellish, hell for leather kind of kind of thing. Again, it starts with a slow movement, and it's a really hard start because every all the strings are all together. <laughs> So it's a it's a great challenge, but really good fun to do. Uh, the fast stuff, oh, oh, oh the fast stuff. Uh, anyone who's done the trombone, I think trombone sonata and trumpet sonata had this, and maybe the horn sonata. It's very typically Hindemith piano-y kind of thing. Fortunately, it's just not on the piano, but the. Uh, in the background this really devilish tune in the strings oh exciting 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 um and it's a, in the opera is a great big it's the temptation of the saint anthony moment with all the chorus kind of shouting to tempt him into getting into mischief and getting up to sinful things um when it sounds as though it's got to the end we come to this bit where the violins are left doing a trill for ages um, and there's this slow slow section starts off with the cellos having this very dramatic tune and, and there's an intensity about the tune and it suddenly melts away to this beautifully spiritual sound sounding sounding chords I'll just see if I can play a little bit of this bit so this is the end of the cellos <laughs> moment in the opera it's a much more extended version and the compositional trick is you put three triads three tonic triads together um, they're all major thirds apart um, so it's a B flat triad and if you keep going down the same way to where you want and it can kind of be a, a, a big fall 
this is relevant to later on. Uh, anyway, after we've got to the end of the, we, we get it in the cellos do it and then there's an even more beautiful version where the, the violins have it really high up and really sp beautifully spread strings, fantastic. Um, we get back to fast stuff again and there's a couple more uh, big um, uh, folk songs that are quoted, old folk songs, and we finish the piece with this mar marvellous fanfare for the brass. Uh, Hallelujah. Brilliant. Brilliant piece. Um, it's got a, it's a lovely clean piece. Really exciting. The last one was quite challenging, but great, really great fun to play. I'd thoroughly recommend listening to it. Um, there's a recording with Hindemith conducting it somewhere. I think I think you get it online. Um, but on the digital console, if you can still still get it, the Blomstedt version is absolutely brilliant. Lovely to hear it. But it's a very, very well, very often played piece. Really good. Um, so... The other piece to think of, uh, the variations on the theme of Hindemith by Walton. Now, as I say, they were great pals, and Walton had always wanted to do a piece for Hindemith. And I think probably when it got to the 50s, both of them were kind of considered a little bit old-fashioned, old hat, and were suffering a little bit from starting to be underperformed a little bit, particularly Hindemith. Hindemith had gone to work in America, getting a few commissions, but he's kind of forgotten about in... in um, in Germany and Europe a little bit um, and so this was a, a way of Wal Walton kind of thanking his mate for playing a viola concerto and just um, reminding him that people did think about him. Uh, the, it's one of the great sets of variations ever. There's a, there's a recording on YouTube, a film on YouTube, a very amazing that we've got it, of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra conducted by George Schell in 1968. And George Shell's recording of this with the Cleveland Orchestra is one of the best records of anything you could hear. It's just so exciting. Um, Walton's there, so he takes a bow at the end. But it's a, it's a really good good film to watch. But as a piece, it, there is nothing quite like it. Um, I, I, I just don't understand why it's not done done more. I can understand why amateur orchestras don't do it, because it's really hard. But totally worth playing. Um, the, the theme that... Well, it took him a long time to find the right theme. It's from the cello concerto by Hindemith, the slow movement of the cello concerto, um, and he he does it exactly as it scored in the in the original, except the cello part is put elsewhere. So obviously there's no no solo cello um, to be had. Um, it, the tune is put in the wind, but the, basically the orchestration is exactly the same. Um, again, very typically Hindemith, and very in interesting. The chords are interesting. Lovely, lovely little tune. It's got there's so many possibilities of how the chords work. Um, you can kind of see why why Walton used it. There's lots of typically Hindemith fourth, lots of fourths going on, but a lovely, lovely tune. Um, interestingly, I'll come back to this uh, in a second. The tune doesn't use all twelve, but it uses ten of the available notes. The A is is the one that's double, but there's ten notes there, uh, and the the other two that they missed out, kind of used a bit later on. And uh, later on in the theme, there's a very interesting moment.
which is the same same line as in Matis de Marlo. Um, Walton pointed it out to Hindemith that it was the same, and Hindemith hadn't noticed. So it's not a quote from Matis de Marlo in the cello concerto. Uh, but that's that's why the, there's a later on there's a quote from Matis de Marlo. Um, now the variations. If you're going to write a set of variations, just trying to organise it, knowing what key you're going to be in, you know, it's best to have a have a system. Um, you can do it in exactly the same format every time. Uh, I don't know if people know the Diabelli variations of, of um, Beethoven. Um, a very simple tune that is just kind of completely transformed by the end. It's like you, you wouldn't recognise the, the tune at all. Um, or you can do it maybe like Brahms, the, the um, St Anthony variations. Do the same kind of format each time, but just change change things around but the format stays the same this the format does stay stay the same most of the way through um Walton was a little bit disgruntled with himself that he hadn't made more of the form um but i think we love him for it because it's it become what he does with the with the music with the harmony is just so brilliant um he's worked out this set of 10 very well, it's nine variations in the finale and he uses the key that he attaches each variation to is according to the notes of the tune. But he misses out the repeated one. So the first note is E, so the first one is based on E. The second one is G sharp, is based on G sharp or A flat. The third one is based on F sharp. The fourth one on, on B. We as listeners or players don't particularly need to know it, but it just makes the piece incredibly colourful. Um, there's also a lot of harmony moving around in the in the theme, and Walton takes great advantage of that. Um, this is too hard for me to play because the orchestration is so so brilliant, so interesting. It's, anyone who knows Belshazzar's Feast and um, the Crown Imperial, obviously, and the Violin Concerto, this is like a, a condensed version of all that in one glorious 25-minute piece. Um, the Hindemith was a great one with his musical language, a great one for for having these kind of strings of, of um, counterpoint, lots of counterpoint and lots of lots of chords that, that he didn't really enjoy harmony for harmony's sake. It was a kind of result of of the of the counterpoint in a kind of barky or barking way. Um, I would dare I say Walton was not quite so clever as Hindemith as a composer, but had a had a really great ear for harmony and chords, and he uses chords in a bit, bit more like a jazz player would would use them. So it's it's thinking about how the chords go from chord to chord rather than the result of counterpoint. I'll just give you an example because this is one of the variations. I think it's variation seven, um, and we can work out what key it's going to be in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's going to be based on A. Uh, but it's not in A, it's in F sharp minor, but it starts on A. And this is, this is a, the orchestration is bassoons and bass clarinet. It's really kind of murky, um, murky, lovely, smoky sound. And this is just jazz chords all over. Sexy, sexy chords. Wonderful. Um, but there's lots of fast Walton stuff that I'm not going to play, but I'm going to play the, just a, a couple of other little bits. The fanfare at the end of, of um, Hindemith, I think you'll remember that little bit. Those, those chords, very triadic and very um, great nobility about it. Um, very glorious. It's, it's like a religiosity about it. Um, Walton's Brass fanfares were a little bit more Hollywood, and a bit more grand, a bit more cheeky, a bit more man of the street. Um, if you want someone to write you a fanfare, Walton is the person to do it. Just imagine coming into a room to this. Um, the chords that Walton uses are fourths and fifths. It's 
doesn't sound like Hindemith, and Hindemith's not the only person that, that used it, but um, there's, a, there's a slight feeling that... that Walton's kind of paying great tribute to his mate. Uh, so this is Variation 9, and it kind of operates as an introduction to the finale. It's a great fugue bit. Um, the tune... is a, in the brass, big fanfares, um, but it's a fantastic moment. anything like Hindemith but it's the Hindemith tune um, great really brilliant brilliant piece um, and the finale is a hell for leather um, fugue and all sorts of stuff lovely great brass great best shatters greasy brass things and then eventually we come back to the theme and at the end of the theme we get this lovely lovely passage again as a um, as a contrast to how how Hindemith writes um, this kind of thing of having a jazz chord just moving from side to side rather than always exploring the possibilities of the harmony, never settling, which is a little bit more Um At the end, Walton has this chord. Could be a love scene in a, in a Hollywood film. And on top of it, the, the cellos, violas, and violins have this lovely tune and it kind of leads up to this fantastic moment, fantastic quote, which you'll probably recognise the music, hope you do. We come to the end. It's finished on three lovely E major chords through the winds and the strings. It's just a great, great piece to get to know. Maybe, maybe a bit hard, <laughs> but it's certainly really worth listening to. So if you've got a bit of time on your hands, go and have a look at the um, the recording on on YouTube of, of the Vienna Phil um, or the George Shell uh, recording the CD of it. Just absolutely fantastic music. Um, as ever, these things sound really hard when they're just when they're top speed. But if the speed's just a little bit, little bit down, they're not so bad. Happy listening.